Hey everyone, welcome to West Park Church at home. Uh, we're looking forward to a great Sunday today. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to have a time of worship, prayer, and uh, some teaching. So we're going to start things off with a message from one of our church families. Welcome to West Park Church. I'm Sasha. I'm Fran. And I'm Michael. We'd like to share some scripture with you today. This is from Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Here we go. Church at home and in person. Well, we just want to say welcome to all of you who are visiting today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'd love if you could jump on our church website and check things out. And if there's any way that we can serve you or help you uh, or any questions that you have, please email the church office, office at westparkchurch.ca, and uh, one of our staff will get back in touch with you. Um, also, everyone, we'd love to be praying for you this week. Please let us know how we can support you in prayer. You can email the church office, and this week our staff and elders will be praying for you. Uh, God continues to do great things here at West Park. This past Sunday, our Chinese ministry celebrated their 10-year anniversary. That's right, 10 years. Uh, we're so thankful for Pastor Joe and for his wife Amy and for the many families who are impacted by this ministry over the past decade. Uh, and um, yeah, please be praying for those who are involved in our Chinese ministry. Thank you so much for your generosity, giving. Uh, and if you want to be a part of that, you can go to westparkchurch.ca slash giving and you can see all the giving options there. Um, also, we want to stay connected with you, so uh, follow us on social media, go on the homepage of our website, and you can sign up for our e-news. And please keep sending in those pictures of you worshiping at home. Uh, it's a great opportunity to see some familiar faces at the beginning of the service, and so you can email those to the church office as well. Well, I just want to highlight a couple of things for you. First of all is seeds. Uh, this is uh, uh, an opportunity for you to be a part of this uh, end of year offering over and above your regular giving. You can go to westparkchurch.ca slash seeds and you can see all the information there. Um, also, uh, we want to highlight the Nativity drive through This is happening soon, December 19th from 5 to 8 p.m. And uh, we encourage you to register your vehicle. Uh, pack up the family, come on out and celebrate uh, the true meaning of Christmas with us on December 19th. You can go to the church website and do that there. And lastly, uh, we want to highlight Christmas Eve. Uh, it's all online this year because of the uh, restrictions with the pandemic, but we encourage you as families on Christmas Eve, set aside some time to watch this together, to celebrate uh, the birth of Jesus Christ together. Our team's working hard on putting together a great service, and you can see that at 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 6 or 8 on Christmas Eve. Um, well, those are all the updates from me, and now you're gonna hear an update from one of our other ministries. Hey students, uh, just wanted to tell you that next week uh, is our last week before the Christmas break, and uh, then we'll have some time off, and then when you go back to school, uh, we'll be coming back to um, youth. But the other thing is, is also next week on Saturday is our um, Christmas party. So junior high is uh, 3 to 5, and senior high is 7 to 9. So hope to see you there. Speaking of Christmas parties, I got this new Christmas gift. And you know what? It helps me focus. Come to think of focus, though, it's more about me forward focus. See you later, students. Thanks. Hi, I'm Pastor Neil. I'm Pastor Corey. And we are here to talk about Discipleship Track. Now, Discipleship Track is a course developed by our staff and using great materials from Nine Marks Ministries. These resources are gospel-centered and designed to help churches grow in their personal and corporate discipleship. 
The goal of Discipleship Track here is to help you develop into a more gospel-centered Christian as you walk closely with Jesus, with others, and grow in your community here at your local church. This is part of our overall discipleship pathway here at West Park and is to be seen as a development course for anyone in our church family. There are two segments of four months and eight total books to read. Now before you think that this is too much material to cover, the books are very manageable. Yeah, each month has a designated book that you will read alongside of what we call your learning partner. And you'll be guided along that pathway by a facilitator who will interact with you, pray alongside of you, and as we gather together, celebrate your growth alongside of the entire community that's taking discipleship track alongside of you. Pastor Corey and I will be hosting an information night over Zoom on Tuesday, January 4th at 7.30 p.m. to go over more details and answer any questions you may have. I have actually seen firsthand through the lens of our young adult ministry just how effective this course is to developing lasting discipleship growth, increased passion for Jesus and his gospel and his church. So if God has placed on your heart a desire to grow and are wondering if this is an opportunity for you, check out this testimony from one of the students who took the pilot project of this course last year and see for yourself. Well, now I have a few more resources in my toolbox, so to speak, when it comes to speaking about theology or just how I view things in general about the Bible or about prayer or about other spiritual disciplines. If I'm honest, I was hoping to have something that was non-social media to fill some of my free time. Um, that was my biggest expectation. I knew it was going to be a great course and that I'd get some some theological exposure, but it was mostly to fill up my time. The importance of having a partner was the most surprising for me. Um, it's one thing to just read about God, but having to actually think it through with somebody else was the surprising part. So I believe that we talk a lot about evangelism and discipleship. Um, oftentimes we have avenues to do evangelism, we don't have a lot to do discipleship, especially when we're called to be a community. So I think I would recommend it because we need to be in community, learning about God together, um, and also doing it on our own. Well, we're going to prepare right now for a time of singing and lifting our hearts to God. And whatever you need to do at home to participate, we encourage you to do that. And uh, let's sing together. Let's worship God together. Let's focus our attention on Him.
just fill the sky with highest praise. Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, King Jesus, Savior of the world, is born. Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, King Jesus, Savior of the world.
Well, it's so much fun to sing carols and uh, get ready for the Christmas season. And as we do that, I wanted to take an opportunity, take some time during our service, both here online and as we will do in person, to really focus our attention, our mind, our heart, our affections on the season of Christmas. As we engage with the Lord, as we anticipate His coming, and one of the reasons that I say we anticipate His coming is not just because of the Christmas season, but because of the fact that we are living in this in-between space of having Jesus have come and awaiting for Jesus' coming again. So as we've been looking at this all the way through Revelation, uh, it's, it's kind of wonderful that we found ourselves in this spot where we're celebrating Advent, we're celebrating the coming of Jesus into the world as he comes in human form as a baby, we celebrate his birth, but also as we look with anticipation to Jesus coming again. So as we do that, I'm going to lead us and guide us through some moments of prayer, and I would encourage you to follow along, to pray along as I, as I guide us in this. First, I'm going to read a passage from Isaiah chapter 9 that really tells us about who it is that we are waiting for. And it says this, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom, he will establish it to uphold with justice and with righteousness from this time forward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. It's exactly who we had waited for. It's exactly as we look to the other side, who it is that we, are, we have seen and who now we are looking in anticipation to see in his coming again. So I'm just going to lead us in these prayers. I would encourage you to join me and pray along. Would you take some time now to pray that Jesus himself would remind your heart, would stir your affections for the things that this passage has let his name to be. That Jesus' name is called Wonderful Counselor. Jesus' name is called the Mighty God. That Jesus' name is called Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. Do you thank him for these deep truths? And would you pray that in this season that God's Holy Spirit would make you attentive to his work in your heart. That you would prepare room, that you would make room, that you would focus room for Jesus to enter in. To be present in your celebrations. To be present in your joy through this season. For those who struggle around the Christmas season, that you would ask Jesus to comfort you in these times. That you would make room for Jesus to heal broken spaces. And that you would invite him to bring you peace. And I'd also invite you to pray and ask God to fill you with hope. The hope that flows from Christmas, the hope that flows from the Savior who has come and the certainty of knowing the Savior who is coming again. Heavenly 
Ask God for the hope that can fill you to understanding the great joy of what is to come. And trusting that what he has said he will do and in trusting that what he has done is so completely sufficient for every need. And finally, would you ask God to simply meet you with his still calming presence? In the hustle and bustle of Christmas that you would find rest in Jesus. That you would find peace in Jesus. That you would find hope in Jesus. So we thank you, God, that you have given us the gift of Christmas to remember on an annual basis that you have come in flesh to be our Emmanuel, God with us. And that in this, in this interesting way, we have, we have seen your coming and we await your coming. So stir our hearts and our affections in this season to experience all the gifts that Christmas brings to us. I ask it in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody, and Merry Christmas. Thanks for being a part of our online service today. Believe it or not, we are getting close to the end of our study in Revelation. We'll wrap things up in early January and then begin a study in the book of Ephesians. Now, in this study, we have seen lots of sobering visions that picture how bad things will get as the world continues to march towards final days. Now, we can't really attach specific dates to these events and when Jesus will return because the Bible is not clear when specifically Jesus will return. But I've said all along that we know how things are going to turn out. Jesus wins, and we must be faithful in the meantime. So, now we will see, after Satan and evil has been vanquished, a phenomenal picture of how God will bring about a new heaven and a new earth, a, a recreation of a restoration, rather, of Eden, only better. Now, today's message is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to explain more what the passage means with a little bit less practical application. But let me tell you, y'all have a lot of great concepts and ideas to consider about what awaits us uh, in this new heaven and new earth. So, even so, here is the big idea today. What awaits Christ's followers? What awaits Christ's followers? In the next life will be absolutely incredible and amazing. Now, as I read this longer passage in a moment, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes if you're comfortable while I read it. And if you uh, are comfortable and do so, I'd like you just to visualize what John has written in this vision. Now, we're going to put some quiet music behind my reading of it, this passage, to kind of to enhance your experience. So here's some guidelines as you do so. There will be some words you may not know but don't get hung up on them. I'll try to come back to them and explain them. Secondly, remember that Revelation is filled with figurative language that symbolize deeper spiritual truths. Yet also those visions refer to actual physical realities. So after I read, I'm going to come back and try to explain some of these figurative and physical realities these images point to. So here is how one biblical scholar explained these visions as they relate to 
uh, reality and visions to, to each other. There are really kind of two levels of meaning to think about. Here's what one scholar said. He says, on one level, he, that is John, sees these visions as composed of earthly pictures which we can understand, whether they be lions or human figures or books or somebody measuring a wall in an ordinary manner. So that's one, one side of the coin. The second side of the coin is this, the scholar said, however, the purpose or the second level of the visionary images is to reveal to John the deeper meaning or heavenly truths which the earthly images symbolize. So I think you really kind of capture that well. So we're going to be in Revelation 21 through the first part of 22. Now, I want you to get a sense of the grandeur of this new creation, the new heaven and the new earth, that God will bring about after the final days of earth that he promises to his faithful. So, again, if you're comfortable to do so, I'd encourage you just to close your eyes and visualize as I read this section of Scripture. Okay. Revelation 21, starting at verse 9. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain, great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with a rod and found it to be twelve thousand stadia, coming back to that, 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. He measured its wall and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, and the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh adjacent, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of pure gold like transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light and the lamp is its light. The lamb rather is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. 
and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Okay, you can open up your eyes. Well, that was some pretty amazing stuff, huh? So let's walk through that passage, and I'm going to try to unpack it a bit for you. Now, one of the angels that has appeared throughout Revelation again shows up and appears uh, to John to explain this vision. So it says in here in verse 10, And he, this is this angel, carried him away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Now here's a, an old artist perspective of this vision here. This is not a vision like a city coming down from above like on a space platform. Rather, he has this high view, and right up here, I don't know if you can see it very well, right up there, he has this high perspective on this mountain because this new city is so large and it's coming from above. Now, whereas throughout history, humanity has tried to ascend to God with their works, to merit favor with Him, God has descended to us, like this city is shown descending by sending Jesus, who came from heaven, to go to a cross to pay for our sins. Now, the holy city represents an, really an amalgamation of what heaven and earth, joined and renewed, will be like after the final judgment. And that will be perfect, perfect in every way that this vision illustrates in several ways. It says in verse 11, It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Now, here's a picture of um, a common a jasper, uh, jasper stone. Back then, it was very popular, and it's pr a prized stone, and could be red, it could be green or yellow. But what John does here, he records a new quality. He calls it as clear as crystal. This is how John often records aspects of this new creation. He starts with something we know, and then he adds something new to our understanding so that it really stretches our, our thinking. His goal is to emphasize its dazzling beauty, this new heaven, new earth. It's dazzling beauty and God's glory that will be there in all its majesty and radiance and purity. So this new heaven and new earth, this new creation, this holy city, will be a place of such phenomenal beauty and wonder that human language can't really describe it and our human minds couldn't even comprehend it. So as he describes this new creation, it's really akin to seeing an image out of focus in black and white compared to the the actual one. So I've got two images side by side here. So here's the original image of a you know, nice setting on a beach. And so this is what heaven will be like, the new heaven, new earth. But this is how we kind of understand it now, kind of blurry out of focus. Now often we go, when, we go to places, when we go to places like these, we say, oh my, it's so much more beautiful than I thought. That's the idea here. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, he says this, he says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. So it's going to be mind-blowing. Then he says in verse 12, he describes a high wall with these 12 gates, and there are 12 angels at the gates, and on these gates are written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, there were three gates on the east and the north and the south and the west. And this wall has 12 foundations. And on them were these names of the 12 apostles. So what he's doing here is bringing together the Old Testament 12 tribes of Israel and the New Testament 12 apostles, which together represent the church built on the foundation of Christ. He gives a continuity with the biblical story from the Old Testament all the way into the New Testament. So the combination of the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles is a way of saying that Israel of old and the Christian church now, in some way there will be connection in God's final scheme of things. Then he says in verse 15, This angel again, who talked with me, had this measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. 
So since the city is gold, a gold measuring tool would seem to be the appropriate measuring tool, right? Now, in, in antiquity, way back then, a measuring something implied security and protection. So here it implies God's final and eternal presence, guaranteeing the absence of tears and pain and suffering for all those who are in this new heaven and new earth. He next gives the dimensions, which are figurative, though they do point to a real place, this new heaven and new earth. He said it was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide, uh, uh, it was as long as it was wide, and he measured it, and he found it to be 12,000 stadia in length. Now, stadia is equivalent to the distance between, or this 12,000 stadia, between New York City and London, London, England. And the size of the known world at that time was pretty much that size. That is massive. Now, it's actually a cube because he talks about its length and width and its height. So it's actually a cube. Now, cube symbolized perfection. Way back in the Old Testament at Solomon's temple, the Holy of Holies, where God was seen to dwell, was also a perfect cube. So these are standards and measurements and materials that we understand. Now, this new heaven and new earth will be new, and the standards and measurements and materials will be exponentially more amazing than what we can comprehend now. Now, as the size of this cube is like mind-blowing, what this new creation will actually be will be dramatically uh, uh, amazing, far beyond, exceed our understanding. And he says in 17, he measured its wall, and it was 144 cubits thick. Now, a cubit was the length from your middle finger to your elbow in ancient times. So 144 cubits would be 216 feet or 66 meters, a very thick wall. Now, if you've been a part of our Revelation series, John mentions 144,000 people, which is not the number who will be in heaven, but reflects the complete whole number of God's people in general. And this 144 may reach back into that 144,000. But he continues to describe it, this wall made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. A lot of interesting stuff in this one. We see jasper here again. And Jasper, John uses it somewhat of a symbol of God so that we can say that the wall is from God and reveals God. Now, here is another mind stretch, especially for the believers in biblical times and afterwards. Their glass was not like our glass, which is pure and clear. You know, you get a good glass, you can just see through it. However, back then, their glass was vastly different. It had all kinds of impurities in it, and it was dark. So something like pure glass to them would be beyond their understanding of glass, something very rare and very costly. Now, he talks about gemstones next. Now, one of the things that I love to do uh, and play with are gemstones. I just love gemstones. They're, just, they're fascinating to me. Have you ever gone on vacation and gone into one of those stores in a touristy area and seen displays or barrels full of these, all these uh, rock uh, machine tumbled uh, stones. I love to just stick my hand in and just feel all those stones. And I know I'm kind of weird, but I love doing that. Well, the next part of the vision is a visual feast, especially if you like gemstones like me. Here's what he, he lists all these gemstones. The foundations of the walls, they were decorated with every kind of precious stone. There was jasper, there was sapphire, chalcedony, there was the emerald, sardonyx, Carnelian, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, chrysophrase, jacinth, and amethyst. Now, these various kinds of stones may be connected back to the Old Testament. You may recall this little image I gave some time back in the message. In the Old Testament, the high priest, this is the high priest right here, the high priest would have on his chest, you can see right there, a chest plate that reflected this image that you can see to, to the right. And these 12 stones, they represented the 12 tribes, so that when he entered the temple, he was representing all the tribes, all the Hebrew people. Now, eight of these stones John writes about here perfectly match up with the eight on the high priest breastplate. And biblical scholars say there is evidence that the other four are equivalent stones, just under a different name. So in the Old Testament, 
The jewels represent the 12 tribes, and here they represent the 12 apostles. Now, since the names of the apostles were on the foundations along with these precious stones, it reminds us of the various facets of the character of God that we learned through the apostles' teaching and through their writings. They also portray the new creation because some of the very same stones here were actually found in the Garden of Eden that the prophet Ezekiel mentioned in Ezekiel 28. Now, this next image is mind-blowing. It says the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. Now, in those days, pearls were considered the most valued stones. And in the Gospels, Jesus referred to merchants who would literally, literally consider selling all their possessions to find a pearl of great price. Now, these 12 pearls, which had to span the, the length of the, of the gateway from the outside to the inside, would have to be 66 meters long. That would require a pretty big oyster. <laughs> now, I'm being facetious here. The vision, again, is meant to drop our jaw with figurative language to describe the grandeur of this new heaven and new earth. Then he goes on to say, The great street of the city was of pure gold, like transparent glass. Another mind-blowing image here. There's this main thoroughfare, thoroughfare and probably the uh, all the streets, just like as this one, are made of pure gold, but not everyday gold. He describes this gold as transparent. Now, how in the world is gold like transparent glass? This reminds us again of the impossibility of human language to describe its beauty. The streets and their multiple gates, which requires multiple streets, are the pure gold that you could actually see through. This is possible because the glory of God will permeate everything in this new heaven and new earth. Verse 22, he says, I did not see a temple in the city. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Now, the temple was where the Hebrew people understood God to dwell. And you went to the temple to meet God. Now, there's no temple building because God himself and Jesus are the new temple and the city's light source. Now, in the Bible, the idea of the temple morphs from their kind of stages. It morphs from a physical building to Jesus, who refers to his body as the temple, as the new temple in the gospel, to believers as the temple of the Holy Spirit, to here, where he says the temple is seen as the presence of God in the midst of his people. Then he says in verse 23, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Now, this does not necessarily imply there is no more sun or moon, but that they pale in comparison to the light from the glory of God. His resplendent light is sufficient enough to light up this whole place. Verse 25, he says, On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. Now, since Satan and his demons have been forever vanquished into what is called the lake of fire, and he can't leave it, there is no fear of enemies encroaching on heaven. So, unlike ancient cities that would raise their gates at night for protection from the enemies, there will be no need in heaven to do so because its inhabitants are perfectly safe. Then he says, Nothing impure will ever enter, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So this new heaven and earth will be open to all who previously opened their hearts to Jesus. Those excluded, he describes as the impure and shameful and deceitful, are the outright rejectors of Jesus, but also include fake Christians, those who are Christian in name only. And then here, this Lamb's Book of Life is kind of like a, a heavenly registry of all those who have opened their hearts to Jesus. Now, he next describes in more detail this new heaven and new earth, Eden restored. It tells of the incredible blessings awaiting us, uh, regaining access to the benefits of the tree of life that Adam and Eve had no access to after they sinned, permanent healing, and the dispelling of all darkness and fears that come from being afraid of the dark and the unknown. Now, whereas the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament temple was God's dwelling place, then he was kind of seen as more localized, and only the high priest could go in once a year, 
Now the entire city of God, the new heaven and new earth, is the functional temple as God is now directly dwelling among His people so that the entire city has now become the Holy of Holies where God makes His home with His people. And the final Garden of Eden returns. In fact, it's interesting, the word Eden means Garden of Delight in Hebrew language. So Adam and Eve, the first humans, were placed in the garden not only to enjoy it, but also to care for it with joyful, non-stressful service to God. So it seems to me that that same kind of joyful activity and enjoyable work will also be in heaven. So here is this new city of God. It's become one with this newly created Eden. He says in verse 22, or chapter 21, verse 1, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So John is reminding us here again that God and the Lamb are one, reminding us of the deity of Jesus. In fact, 45 times the word throne is used to, to remind us that God is sovereign and he's a protector of his people. He says in verse 2, he says, Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood this tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Now, what does that mean? Well, we see another 12 here. In addition to the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles and the 12 gates and the 12 foundations, remember, 12 indicates completeness. So the main features include a kind of a main street, the primary thoroughfare, a kind of a super highway of sorts, a great pure river that flows from God's throne, and multiple trees. The singular tree here really uh, is referring to multiple trees, all bearing fruit in a park-like oasis setting. Now, it's not just one park, but a massive city full of parks. And the fruit, the leaves, the clean water all point to the abundant provision of our salvation. Now, this is very interesting here, this healing, these leaves here. What does that mean? The healing leaves symbolize that healing has already taken place. There is no continued further healing necessary since there's no more crying or pain in heaven. Now, some scholars actually believe that they see these leaves as health-giving, um, and that explains what they do. Somehow, they promote the enjoyment we will experience in the new heaven and the new earth. They aren't all uh, involved in uh, correcting ills or sickness or healing sickness because there is no sickness there. So here, the Garden of Eden is reestablished and is part of the new heaven and the new earth. Now, in heaven, everyone... All the nations, he says here, has access to the blessings of this tree, the physical and spiritual blessings, and have already been healed the leaves of the tree. Verse 3, he says, No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him, and they will reign forever and ever. In other words, we will joyfully accomplish things in service to God, and the curse of sin will be no more. Now remember that the big picture purpose of these visions is to motivate us to resist compromise in a world that will become increasingly hostile to Christianity. They remind us to be faithful until we go join the Lord in the end times or if He takes us up and if we're still alive here on the earth. So this new heaven and new earth and new city of Jerusalem and new garden all merge into the all encompassing nature of what God will recreate and restore and where you and I will spend eternity after the final judgment. So let me give you four simple takeaways from this passage. Four simple takeaways. Here's takeaway number one. This new heaven and earth will be big enough for everyone who believes. The angels will be our next door neighbors. The Old Testament heroes as well, as well as the apostles, they'll live down the street from us. Our friends and our family who trusted Christ will be there to greet us. We will know it is them because there will be recognition in the new heaven and the new earth. So there, it will be big enough for everyone who believes. Secondly, it will stun you with its beauty. Imagine spending eternity in a garden that combines the, I think it's called the Kuchenhof, uh, the Tulip Garden of Holland, 
with the butcher gardens in um, Vancouver, or on Vancouver Island, and the Queen's Royal Garden, uh, which is on the grounds of Buckingham Palace. Take all of these beautiful gardens in the world, put them all together, and they still won't hold a candle to the new Garden of Eden in heaven. So it'll be big enough for everyone who believes. It will stun you with its beauty. And here's number three. It will bless you with infinite and eternal satisfaction in God's presence. We will be with Him forever in the presence of Jesus. And here's the fourth one. It beckons those far from God to turn to Him so they can spend eternity in that place. So I don't know where you are spiritually, but if you've not received Jesus' forgiveness, if you've not placed your faith in Jesus, you will miss this. But you don't have to. This can be yours. This new heaven, this new earth, this eternal place where there's no more crying, no more tears, no more pain, but perfection and joyful service to Jesus. And you can simply place your faith in Jesus right now and have the promise that this will be yours. So I'm going to pray for you right now. Would you bow your head? So I'm going to speak specifically to those of you who are watching uh, right now. Maybe you've never come into a relationship with Jesus. But what a, what a great time to do that this Christmas season. Jesus was God's son, came to earth, lived a perfect life, though he was tempted, was crucified on a cross, bearing your sin and mine, and rose from the dead. He ascended to the Father, and he did that for you and for me. And you can come into a relationship with him by simply telling him something like this in your heart. Dear Jesus, I admit that I have sinned. I have turned from you. I turn from my sins. I believe in you. I believe that you, Jesus, died on the cross for me and rose from the dead. I place my faith in Jesus. I want to become a follower of Jesus. In your name, amen. Well, if you just now prayed that, I, I hope you let us know. You can send us an email at office at westparkchurch.ca and we'll send you an email about how to really grow in this new relationship. Well, thank you so much for being part of this service. And this week, just think about that wonderful place that will be ours one day, this new heaven and new earth. God bless. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we want you to know that we love you. We're praying for you. Uh, please join us next week. And uh, you are love, church. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.